coming to the 340 session. And welcome to everybody out in cyberspace. Uh, you coming to the 330 session of Open Education Revolution, from open access to open credentialing. And um, this is Una Daly. I am the Community College Outreach Manager at the Open Courseware Consortium. Um, so I um, am a staff member for the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, um, which uh, a number of people in this room have worked on and help found. Um, they'll remain anonymous. Um, anyway, um, let's see. I think we're we're good to go, right, Marty? Yeah, we're rolling. Okay, excellent. Well, I'm not a PC person. Okay, so <laughs> I told you who I was, and. Um, I was going to mention, I gave this presentation um, about six months ago at the Mid-Pacific Information Communications Technology Consortium meeting up at uh, San Francisco City College, and, um, and, and Lady Morrow and, and the rest of his gang, Marty and, and Michelle, I believe, were all up there, and um, he asked me to give it again, and I said, well, okay, uh, I'll give it again, uh, you know, six months later, and it's so I had to redo the slides, and it turns out so much has happened in the last six months in the open education space. Um, I'm sure you'll hear more about Udacity, Coursera, MITx. These have all been announced in the last six months, and um, it's not really clear exactly where they're going, but they are um, big, big changes, and um, so. That's, we're going to kind of talk about that, uh, those future directions, those trends. So uh, since we have a small group, um, I think it would be great if we went around and just introduced ourselves briefly and um, perhaps what your interest is in open education or if you've got a background in it. And let's we'll start with LeBaron. LeBaron Goodyard, I'm a dean for academic affairs at the Chancellor's Office of the California Community Colleges. My interest and in experience there. Is this is one of my assignments in the chapter's office, is uh, open education resources. It was, it was will to me. <laughs> that sounds ominous. It, it, well, it's that it's, I've, 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 I've gotten so much out of it. I mean, really. So. But it wasn't anything that my division was doing initially. It was done in student services when it first came out. Um, student services being passed it over to academic affairs. And, I'm yeah. Person that was very fortunate to, to, to get it. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, wonderful. I'm, I'm glad you came. Um, we have eight colleges in California that are official members, but we have many more that participate on our advisory group and in, in pretty much all of our activities. So California is a huge part of this movement. So, great. My name is Max Stranger here, and I'm the certificate college faculty at Evergreen Valley College. And uh, we are really, really trying to grow our online courses and trying to put together our program. So, uh, and with that, um, I'm trying to, I'm really, really interested in the open education research and all um, so that we can promote that from the mind about my faculty and help them to why we even believe that is. Absolutely, yeah, and um, I'd love you to have to join us at, on our advisory group, and um, we meet online monthly. Yeah, so wonderful. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Neil O'Brien with the College of San Mateo. Um, I work in the career area as a counselor. Mm -hmm. You need to repeat. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, um, Yes, yes, go ahead. Eileen O'Brien from College of San Mateo. Yeah. I just work in the career uh, counseling area. I do academic and career counseling, and uh, I'm just interested. I just recently learned about this topic, and just thought it would be interesting to find out more about it. Great, great. And so um, Eileen is in career counseling, career counseling and advising, and she would like to find out more about open ed. Super. Yes. I'm Hassan Rahim, from the City College. I teach math, science, and statistics. Great. And I also write about uh, the trend in online education. I write a writing about open course consortium, getting my students familiar with all the resources that they Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, we have a faculty member from San Jose City College who is writing articles about online 
emerging trends in online technology and is showing his students um, open courseware uh, resources. Great, glad you could make it. Yes. Hi, I, my name is Paula Gilbert. I teach at Moderation at Central College and um, I teach you to play online and composition reading face to face. And I'm just curious about the topic. I want to see where, where it's still you know, it's still an education thing. All right. Oh, great. I, you said you were from Monterey Peninsula? Yes, Monterey Peninsula. Okay, so we have an instructor, uh, English instructor from Monterey Peninsula, um, who is interested in finding out more about these resources. Um, we have a gentleman from your computer science department, DJ Singh, who's on our advisory group. Yeah. So DJ, DJ's great. Yeah. Uh, April. Yeah, April. Yes, from the college. I worked at the Learning Center, and I worked at the end of I, my job going forward, I just would like to encourage more faculty, um, you know, contributing or using more, you know, open resources. So we do have a few, you know, real big leaders like Barbara and Hopsky, but if you look at them, or the rest of the campus, we really not like the really Yeah. Thank you. So that was April Jin from De Anza College, who's in the learning, um, ed learning education area, sorry, distance learning area. Thank you. And um, although they have some big leaders um, at De Anza in Open Edge, she would like to see that spread further. Um, great. I'm um, um, Chief Baker, Dean of Online Learning at Woodhill College, and I'd like to see where this whole OER thing is going. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. That's Judy Baker from <laughs> Foothill College, the Dean of Technology and Innovation there, and um, she wants to see where OER is going. Especially in terms of uh, credentialing. Credentialing. All right. Good. Thank you. Oh, good. Oh, great. It's pretty recent, yes. Uh, Jackie Hood here from College Open Textbooks. Jackie and I worked together for a year, year and a half, almost two years on a College Open Textbook as part of the uh, consortium work. Wonderful. Yes. Basically, I just want to see whether open courseware is the way to go for leaving my courses after I retire. Oh, interesting. Okay, so John from San Jose City College, and uh, John is contemplating whether it sounds like retirement is on the horizon, maybe a ways out there, but whether he wants to leave his courses as kind of a legacy as open courseware. And which discipline are you in, John? Civilization. Civilization in the humanities. Okay, wonderful. All right, the gentleman in the back. Wonderful. So it's Al Smith, you're a Al Smith, I'm sorry. And you're a counselor at which college again? Merced College and is interested in finding out more about the open ed resources. Okay, wonderful. Glad you could make it. We have some online Ah uh, yes, we do have some online folks. Did any uh, Marty, did we have any? Oh, uh, Pilar Hernandez, Professor of Spanish, Miracosta. Oh, one, wonderful. Yeah. Welcome, Pilar. Mitty Mathafi, Long Beach City College, teaching online hybrid math. Great. Welcome, Mitty. Okay, great. All right. So, here's our overview. We'll see how we can get this, get you guys out of here and still, still, um, have a discussion about what's going on. So <laughs> I was putting together a timeline. Probably should have talked to Judy or somebody about this. I'm, yeah, I had a little typo there. But um, about the timeline of what's happened over the last decade. And you know, if you think about open ed, um, this, this is probably the latest rendition of it, of it. Many of you may have heard of open university in England. And that was a movement that started in the late 60s, and that was about open access. Um, and because open content hadn't really become 
an issue the same way it has with the Internet and our information explosion. But what happened with the rise of the Internet was we had all these materials. Uh, instructors were probably already producing them, um, but there was we sort of hit a critical mass. And it wasn't just, obviously, in the education area. It was also in music. Uh, video would come a few years later. But essentially, people were out there creating things. And immediately when you create something, it becomes copyrighted. And that means that it can't be shared without specific permission from the holder. And so Creative Commons was started at Stanford by a gentleman called Larry Lessig, who was in their legal, department, legal teaching area at that time. And he came up with this way of sharing, so to allow the holder of the copyright to release some of their rights so that other people could reuse it as long as they were given attribution. And I could spend a whole hour talking about the details around that. I won't, but, it's, but it is really the legal infrastructure that makes open ed possible. Um, MIT then announced uh, approximately the same time that they were going to put their courses online. And I don't know if many of you remember back then, there was a lot of dismay from other uh, universities who were um, thinking that on, online courses was going to really make a lot of money for them. And as they watched um, MIT do this, and as their reputation built, um, there was a, a change, and many other universities came online, and it became a worldwide organization, a consortium in 2004. And it continues to grow, and in fact, it's really growing. The biggest area right now is Asia uh, for, the, for, the, for the Open Courseware Consortium, and that's probably not surprising as they have the most people to educate with the population centers. Then along a few years later, the Community College Consortium was born. And I'll talk a little more about that. But um, that was the recognition that community colleges weren't getting involved in open ed. And where affordability was a big issue in the community colleges, where the cost of instructional materials is a much larger percentage um, versus tuition than in four-year in universities, it was really key that this happened. And, and it happened in California. Um, a few years later, we started. There started to be the fringe movement of the massive open online courses, and you probably didn't hear about them. I don't think I heard about them until a couple years ago. There were some other organizations that started up peer-to-peer -peer university, which is a. Uh, it's really more of an open learning community where people come together to learn things, um, and it's an open facilitation and very interactive and social media driven. OER University was founded just about a year ago. They were inaugurated. That is a, a, a consortium of universities uh, worldwide. There's a couple in the United States. There are several in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and um, um, yeah, there, there's one in India as well. I'm not sh I'm not sure all of the continents, but there's but they are they are fairly widespread, and they are looking at ways of taking um, open ed resources and providing open assessment so that students can get credit using this at their universities. Then I think the really big event was last fall. Stanford offered artificial intelligence in what is a massive online course and um, 160,000 people worldwide signed up. Um, and, I, and I think about 20,000 completed it. I think that was about the number. And there was about 200 students, I think, on campus taking it. And I'll get into a little bit more. But at that point, Udacity, which was uh, built by Sebastian Thrun, he decided to leave his full-time teaching position at Stanford and start that company. It's a commercial company. It's a dot-com. And uh, a number of other people jumped into the mix. Uh, so what was the original mission? So it was advancing um, learning, both formal and informal. Um, so looking at not only just students, but uh, self-learners, workers, uh, et cetera, so that this free and open high quality education could be available worldwide. And over 200, this, is, this slide's a little old now, it's about six months old, but over 250 institutions in 46 countries have joined the Open Courseware Consortium. That is not the only organization. To, there's actually, in the US, there's a number of big name universities that have their own initiative. We certainly par partner with them in the Open Courseware, but they're not within the, the consortium. So that number looks a little light, but it, it is the largest consortium. 
And the growth went from 500 courses online to we're at about 18,000 courses online. This alone is in the Open Courseware Consortium. Over 3,500 have been translated into other languages. So it's, there's been a growth in the last 10 years. But what people were finding is you have, the, you have your self-learner at home. What, what those original courses were were, were streamed video, uh, syllabi, and course notes. Uh, there was no community. There was no interactivity. Uh, it was learn on your own and, and good luck with it. Um, so um, it was a good start. Um, and this survey was taken um, a little over a year ago about who are, the, who are the people who are going up there on the site and self-learning. Well, as you can see, about 40% are students, and primarily they are higher ed students, which is not too unusual um, since these are college resources um, for the most part. Um, we see that about 45% are not students. They are either working people who are trying to better themselves or they're self-learners who perhaps may be unemployed. And we don't really have the breakdown there. But you can see that about half of the people using this are self-learners. They are outside of the academic institution, so what we'll call non-traditional learners. Uh, the number of teachers who are using this is actually pretty small. This says 12%. I've seen other uh, surveys that have showed it lower than that. That's the highest I've seen. So unfortunately, I think a, this was targeted at educators at one point as, as well and uh, uh, just a, a small percentage have taken advantage of it. So there's, there's room for growth there. Um, so what do non-traditional learners need? Um, they need proof of their learning. Uh, because what, as you learn this material, you want to be able to take this now to an employer or potentially uh, perhaps if you were doing a transfer agreement into another institution. And so there's a couple of things that have uh, arisen recently. Um, well, the, the one thing um, that has just come out in the last year is badges. And these are very skills-based. And it's still a little controversial. Um, for the most part, it has been targeted at web skills, either web development. Uh, it actually, the idea originally came from gaming. So in games, as you become more and more proficient, you, you develop these badges. You become a wizard and you, I don't know, an arch wizard. I'm, of course, I'm not a gamer, so I'm making some of that up. But I know that that's where it originally came from. And it's very self-motivating. And now it's been kind of pushed out. And I think if you've been watching Haystack, which is a, which is, who is, Haystack is Duke and who else? There's a number of, um, there's a number of big universities who, who have um, been supporting the badges. There was a competition last year on um, submitting designs for badges. And this is, a, this is a way for people to get some quick skills. It's somewhat equivalent to the certificate idea that is very popular at um, community colleges. And um, let's, uh, we're going to see now what has happened with certificates. So I don't know if you caught this. This was actually, um, this was inside higher ed a couple of weeks ago, and they talked about post-secondary credentials and what has happened. Well, certificates are the fastest growing area. Um, they account for 22% of the total post-secondary um, credentials that are um, delivered. And this is, this is from a Georgetown University um, report that was made. And the growth has been huge because in 1980, it was about 6%. And when they interviewed um, students, they said, well, these certificates cost less than, say, doing an AA or an AS. They're um, quicker to achieve. Generally, they're one year. I mean, there are some that are longer, and there's some that are shorter. And they often feel that they can get more salary because it's very specific what that certificate is addressing. So when an employer sees that, they know what skills that student is coming in with, as opposed to an AA or an AS. It's a little vague, and you, you need to have a conversation and really investigate that. Um, and this was a piece that I found very surprising, why certificates are a catalyst for college degrees. Uh, what they reported was that 66% um, of the people who are receiving, who have received these certificates, um, they, they have gone on to get a college degree which I think is very impressive, and I was unaware of that. I, did I, does anyone else find that surprising? No. Um, 
Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So perhaps that was just because I have you know, when I have taught at Foothill, I taught in the computer technology area, and we often actually got people who had degrees and they came in at night and they were earning certificates. So it was the reverse. But yeah. Um, so I think that that's actually very. Um, I think that's a wonderful trend. And um, public and private two-year colleges award 70% of certificates. So I, I mention this to you because that is sort of our bread and butter business. And now we have some of the larger four-year Ivy League type universities getting into that business. So it's something for us to look at. Um, I wanted to just give you a little bit more detail about OER University. Um, what they are looking at is this open assessment. Um, so um, students use OER, they learn the material, they can then go to a participating institution and take an open assessment. And if they pass that assessment, then they can get credit uh, for courses at that institution. And eventually they could get a degree through that. So it's, it's it's still early days, but it's, um, I think it's a, also a very exciting um, within the institution um, approach, which the, the ones I'm going to talk about in a minute are kind of outside the institution or somewhat outside. Yes. So OER University exists or is it, is it a collaboration it, with the institution? Yes, it's a consortium. consortium. Yeah, and it's actually supported by the OER Foundation in New Zealand. but. Empire State College is a member up in upstate New York. Um, I think there's yeah, Athabasca. Athabasca is definitely um, Thomas River um, College up there. Um, yeah, so there's a, a number of folks. Um, so there's non. So another piece is so they so they need to be able to get a certificate or a credential or something to say I've actually learned something and here you know. Here, here's my uh, proof of that. The other thing they need is they need community. Uh, because here they are learning this all on their own. So, or in this old model, right, with just the open coursework, there, there's no facilitator. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer university introduced the idea of a facilitator. And so the facilitator helps to run that course. They don't call them teachers, but they may do some assessment for the students. They certainly support the students as they're going through the process. Um, Open study on the uh, on the right hand side that is another group and that is really a student run um, peer tutoring service and um, they they have these communities that are around different disciplines and students um, join um, and if you become a very proficient student and you answer the questions of other students you you get these different um, Kind of titles and benefits, which I think you can you can put on your resume. As I'm very proficient in introductory physics, and I answered this many questions of other students. But so it's a place students can go 24/7 and ask questions. If they, you know, particularly if they've got a test the night before, they can go up on Open Study, and there's other students someplace in the world who are willing to answer these. So these are new kind of alternatives to within the institution. Um, and then we had we entered this kind of the age of the MOOC, which is the massively online open courses. And um, so massive, it, it's usually greater than a thousand students. Um, the online pieces, well, of course, it is offered online, but it's the social network piece, and so that's the community. And there's many different ways that that can be achieved. Um, it's open enrollment. Um, it's open content. And um, there are expert facilitators who, who work on it. So, um, and this has just now become, it just kind of became, came into um, really uh, common parlance with the Stanford MOOC this last fall, which I, I mentioned. And I think now, at least, and I, it may only be in California, but I, I think, and certainly in this, in this greater um, San Francisco Bay Area, we were all very aware of this. The headlines were all over the newspapers. Um, and in fact, 20,000 people completed this course who were online students who, were not, who would not have been able to apply to Stanford and get in or pay to do this. So these were your people out there. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of the demographics later on. But 
So Professor Thrun, who's a computer science, he's a robotics professor at Stanford, he said, you know, these people who came in and worked evenings and weekends to complete their course and they never stepped foot on campus, he said, they work harder than my students on campus. They really want to learn. And you know what? I don't want to teach full time at Stanford anymore. He's still a research scientist there. But he gave up that teaching position and he started Udacity. And Udacity is offering um, an array of courses. And any of you can sign up for them. I've already signed up and dropped one. <laughs> <laughs> On, um, let's see, what was it? It was web application engines. And you can either do it self-paced or you can do it with the group. Um, and they have videos. They have streaming videos. They have little interactive quizzes in there. Um, they uh, um, and I never really got past week two, so I can't tell you the midterms and finals. But I believe they do. Um, and they are. They started out with a very much of a computer sciencey, but they are doing introduction to physics, introduction to statistics. So all the things that our students take at the community college who are headed off into those science areas. I think they're still primarily science, but I'm, I'm expecting that they will branch into other disciplines as well shortly. Um, they have just recently announced a um, contract with Pearson Testing Center so that because they would like to offer assessment so that they can give students certificates. And um, they haven't really talked about the pricing yet. I'm assuming it's going to be fairly modest or perhaps equivalent to what Pearson testing is now, which is usually a couple hundred dollars to get like a, a networking license um, as you do with like Cisco and so forth. But um, they, are a, they are a commercial enterprise and they are hiring. So they, they are, so we have now had something that has jumped out and become, um, even though it's open ed, it's open to enroll, you can enroll tonight if you like, uh, find a course up there. Is it unlimited enrollment? Like I believe so because the infrastructure behind these is very significant um, and that's that the people that they're hiring at these companies are the people who do all of the networking and the behind the scenes learning management system pieces. I haven't heard of any limits. Judy, have you? No. Yeah. What do these courses normally cost and also do you have to meet any certain criteria to be accepted? You don't. It's completely open access. If you've got an internet connection and a computer, you can you can sign up. And uh, what do they cost? Well, that's an interesting question. What do they cost at your campus? What would what would an introductory physics course is probably a five unit course? Yeah. Well, that. Yeah. So it would be about two hundred fifty dollars and plus the textbook. So there's no textbook involved in these. Um, all the materials are online. So it's, a, it's not a bad deal. And it remains to be seen if they're going to get the support and the community piece to actually have real learning. Because as we know, it, it can be very hard to learn a subject entirely on your own. And they are offering a lot of interactivity. Some of it's peer. Uh, so there's a lot of peer activity going on, but there is a, there is at least there there are some professional facilitators. Um, so it, it's really brand new. This started in about February or March. Um, so interesting interesting idea. Luna? Yes. I wonder about how they they can make sure their students are who they say they are. Well, that's I don't think they that that bothers them until it's time to test for the certificate. And then that's why they have Pearson Testing Center. Wow. Yes. So they do, so the testing is face to face. Well, no? I believe for the final certificate it is. But there's, the assignments and everything is really done online. I think a lot of it's automated um, for Udacity. Yeah. Um, uh, just lost my train of thought. So they don't give you credit from Stanford. If you get a certificate, would it be from what? It'll be from Udacity. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. It started at Stanford. It is now really independent of Stanford, but it still has the Stanford aura. Okay. And I think, um, well, I think that's important to some employers and may, and for some students, they may and, want that. And the key to this is. Geared towards employment versus uh, 
uh, academic credit. In other words, for the types of courses, particularly like the robotics course, if, if I get that and I can demonstrate that I know that given this credential, give this assessment process and verify that it's me, and I, I got to do a, a standard-based thing, which you hire me, if I can demonstrate I can do the work. So that's, that's the key. Yeah, and I, I was talking to somebody yesterday who, who said something I thought that was very insightful, and they said, well, you know, I could see students at the community college who are pursuing a, an AS in computer science, like a CIS degree, maybe wanting to take one or two of these as well and present that to um, an employer and say, yes, and I also passed these Udacity courses. So you can see that my CIS course was quite good at the college, in case the employer is not familiar with it. And they probably couldn't get any credit for it. So no. Yeah. yeah. I did, I did, I did, I did they talked about how some employers might actually contact them to see, okay, of your 20,000 students, what was your top 1%? Maybe <laughs> those people, and so they can do a reverse recruitment and start going to them and take them just to pound out a crown of the people that can treat those and actually. Going to be, I mean, going after them as potential employees. Right, and they're not subject to purple laws. So, assuming that there, there are people who sign up say that they're willing to have their resume shared with employers, um, they might well, be, they would be able to do this. And I suspect that that would be something uh, students would think was very advantageous. Oh, I have a comment and a question online. Okay. At the bottom of the slide, it mentions partners. What is the nature of that partnership? Okay, so I'm sorry, I didn't actually introduce Coursera. So Coursera has started up as well, and their their theme is we offer high quality courses from the top universities for free to everyone. And their, theirs is a little bit wider span in terms of discipline. They're, they they have definitely computer courses, machine learning, human computer interaction, which I had to drop out after the second week. Oh, gosh, that, that course was really tough. And, um, and I have a computer science degree, so. Um, but um, unfortunately, I had three presentations this week, so I couldn't do my homework this week. But they have introduction to sociology. They've got pharmacology. They've got poetry, music, finance, introduction to true statistics. This is a nonprofit. Um, it is, the partners are Princeton, Stanford, UC Berkeley, all of those schools, and their professors are currently teaching the courses. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see if that continues into the future, but it is materials from those schools, and I don't know, some of you may know more in the room about the Coursera, uh, the background behind it, but um, these ones are completely free. You receive simply a certificate from Coursera. Coursera upon completion. There's a lot of peer assessment that goes on in these classes, and I actually think it's it's very well done. Students are trained on how to assess each other's work, and actually the peer assessment is part of your grade, and they actually throw out the outliers um, of the grading. But it's so it's it's a really interesting model. Yes. How is it sustainable financially? They haven't worked out. They just launched. Months ago, so <laughs> <laughs> they will be the first to admit uh, that they do not yet have a business model, but at some point, they will be able to go to the to didn't you guys consider coming out of Stanford too? Yes, they are in Georgia. Of course, but you, right, you right. have the right. skill, right. you have to pay for it. Right. Yeah. No, actually, yeah. not this one. Right. Not, this one. Right. not so far. And right. that's because I think the business model is fully right. evolving. I had this conversation with Judy when? <laughs> uh, six was it six months ago? Because we were talking about. And yeah, Judy, she's a forward thing. Oh, yeah, I know she is. But, uh, but, but this is true. I mean, it. So you test the waters, you find out where the business model pops up, and then you decide for that. But I think that uh, I think it's going to be on the back end, on um, the assessment side. But after you build your community, then you can start also looking at the financial. It's important to know that Google started out without a business model. So let's see what that's like.
Yeah. But not all companies that start without a business model are succeeding. <laughs> Well, they, they have, some of these have some big foundations behind them. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. So, so how does that do this one over many of these other uh, ed and ed, ed and some of these others is the, the programming behind it is that it, it, there's a lot of robo grading. Um, you'll be watching a video and, uh, after about three or four minutes. Um, they'll pop in a quiz question that's right inside the quiz and uh, it's all auto graded. But also the with the peer discussion boards, which is the pain point for many online faculty, um, moderating and maintaining those discussion boards, very many were intensive to raise to participation on the discussion board, but in um, in Coursera discussions, it's, um, students vote on each other's responses. Yeah. And but they're taught how to how to grade them. And, and, and we're not talking responses. We're talking full project. Yeah. It took me hours to do the first week's homework. And the second week it was like, I don't have three solid days to develop a prototype for my new web app. I mean, I think it was an excellent course. Just, you've got to have I know they're, they're pretty high level and they would be very useful for us, but in the next six months they roll it up, 20 to 40 little revision courses. Yes. I mean, yes. I think we have to keep up with the class. Um, now, you know, I'm, I'm not positive on Coursera. I think you have access to it any time, but if you want to do it with the community, you have to go along yeah. week by week. You can, they have start dates, but once you join it, you can go back and just do it whenever you want. Yes, yes. The so ones that have already occurred, you can go on right now and get into the course. There's still that are scheduled. One start this week, a couple start this week. couple start, and yeah, one started two weeks ago. One start in another two weeks. Yeah, it's uh, pretty exciting. Peer to peer kind of difficult to work on. Do you find that with these two as well? That peer to peer of what? The technology and of Coursera has done a really good job. I was very impressed with the technology. I ran into I ran into no issues with the technology. It was my personal time. I just didn't have the time to do it. Yeah, it's been. Um, what they're also pitching is that you can just use their platform. Now, Coursera has promised that, so that leads me into the next one. And I'm just briefly going to talk about this. MITx actually announced this in December. And so they were the first ones really to announce this big MOOC thing in a big way, um, you know, kind of outside the university. And yet they've been sort of the slowest off the, off the block. Um, They've offered circuits and electronics. They offered that in March and April, I think, in May. Um, and they said they were testing it out, and they said that they would eventually be doing credentials or certificates for a modest fee. I have heard nothing more about that. I think that what they have offered, and I didn't know Coursera had offered this, they offered this open source online learning platform, which they plan to make available. Yeah, I think they've got some politics to think. I easily didn't anticipate that. But is it true that Coursera has also offered that? Uh, that's, that's, you know, all of us in the flux, they said they're thinking about doing that. Because I hadn't seen really it. Partners. Yeah, I hadn't seen that in the press. So this is all a very fluid situation. Yeah. yeah. And nobody knows where it's going and stuff like that. That's right. Well, but, it's, but it's, but it's, uh, all of this. These last three things have happened in the last six months, which is why it's pretty fun. This is great for a reality TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Very briefly, I just wanted to to show you some of the demographics, and this is this is like less than a semester worth of information. So Coursera, their machine learning, which was the first course they offered, about 50% working professionals. 40% were already in software. So 33% uh, were students. Um, and then they talked about what they wanted to achieve out of it. Um, over 50% either want to get a better job or they're trying to sharpen their skills in their current job. And about 40% are curious. And then the rest is a little unknown. Um, Udacity uh, really didn't have those statistics, but they said they w that the students wanted to sharpen skills, or three quarters of their students. So it's a slightly higher, but real early days now. And they said they had a mixture of students and professionals. I think what what is probably 
maybe more interesting for us at the community college is where do these people live? Um, and right now, these are the very early numbers. Coursera said 74. So almost three quarters of their students are outside the United States. And I was somewhat surprised by the countries, Brazil, Britain, India, and Russia. But maybe, maybe that isn't surprising considered they're very, right now they're very techy courses and those tend to be areas where there's a lot of technology occurring. Yes? Any stats on completion? I, no, no, other than that first, yeah, than that first Stanford course where I don't even know what you would say 160 to 20,000 is. But Udacity said a great majority live abroad. And there was an article on this in higher ed, and what they said was, well, so far this, the competition, they may be raising competition against foreign universities because those students would presumably attend foreign universities since three quarters or somewhere between 60 and three quarters are outside of the U.S. Well, so I come back, what, what, what does this have to do with us? I mean, this, this stuff's kind of weird, right? Well, um, we're open enrollment. They're open enrollment. Who's our target audience? Students pursuing credentials, professionals and self-learners. Um, well, self-learners who come into the institution, so same audience. Affordability, yeah. Uh, flexible learning schedules, that's us, and uh, degrees and certificates. Well, you know what? There's a lot of similarities between these MOOCs and us, at least on the face of it. <laughs> so this takes me to the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, So, which is, which is the organization that I um, that I lead with, along with James Blackabrose Clegg, who had to drive home, who's the president of our advisory board, and we are open to all community colleges. We were founded about five years ago, and last year we joined the Open Courseware Consortium. We are now the associate, we're the community college consortium within there. Our mission really remains the same. And I'm sorry, Martha Cantor, who I hope you saw her wonderful picture, she was one of the founders. She, um, who is now our undersecretary of education, and. Um, Judy Baker, I must say, was one, another co-founder of that um, movement. So it, our mission is the same, even though we are now in a larger and more global um, stage, if you will. Um, and that's promoting adoption of OER to improve teaching and learning. And improving teaching and learning is, you know, that's the bottom line. And we feel that through OER, we can expand access to education by making it more affordable. And we want to empower faculty to uh, find create and share their own resources, and so we do a lot of faculty development um, online and some in person, and we want to remain the community college voice so that we're advancing a community college mission in open education. We're um, not planning to jump on the Ivy League banner or bandwagon. Um, I wanted to just mention to you briefly, and I don't want to distract from this, but community colleges have been doing open education quite a while now. And um, you've probably heard about some of those today. I mean, today or yesterday. Um, I know Jackie talked a lot about open courseware just an hour ago in here. Um, Judy presented on her health ed course where she threw away the textbook. One of the more recent systematic approaches to open course work for the community college has been Washington State's open course library. Two years ago, they sat down and they decided uh, that they were going to create um, open courseware for the top 82 enrolled courses in community colleges. They have completed the first half of that. Those courses are completely open to you. Uh, you can download the materials, customize them, and bring them into your learning management system. They're available in common cartridge, or you can simply get them out of um, you can get them out of their angel system directly. Um, so. This, is, this can be an opportunity for those of you who are looking for open courseware in your discipline. And um, these, these, are the first, these are the first 41 courses, the, uh, or I think it's 41 or 42. And, and the next 39 um, are, are in process right now and will be available, I think, end of next year. But you can see that even this first 41 are quite a wide spectrum of courses that are available. So, um, 
many other community colleges are doing this, but Washington State did this as a state, and um, so they had a very coherent kind of model. So what are our priorities for the consortium going, going forward into next year? Well, we are going to continue to do faculty outreach, education. We have monthly webinars. I'll mention what we had last year in a moment. But this next year, we want to really look at documenting the impact of OER on teaching and learning. So we're going to try and gather and compile some research. And actually, it turns out there's been a number of very exciting projects going on, some of the next generation learning grant projects that occurred in community colleges around the nation over the last year and a half have just started publishing their results. So we're going to bring that out to other community colleges so you can see what the success rates have been of students. And we want to promote integration of OER into curricula. And um, I'll say no more about that. We have a few deans here who can pipe in on that one and know a lot more about that. But we know that that's an important piece is that if you're bringing this into your curricula, you want to make sure that you're um, within your accreditation and we, we, have, we have a fairly clear direction in that area that um, CSU and the UCs are open to um, open educational resources. And um, this last year, we had, um, we had a monthly outreach webinar. Um, and so you can see we did open math, which was developmental math. We did uh, lower division writing. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, we did. Uh, I'll just say we have one last one, the end of June, um, and it's going to be on faculty perceptions of OER. We're going to have a gentleman uh, from Oregon presenting with with Dr. Judy Baker, who's going to present also transforming your classroom with OER. It's also now called. The, I changed it from pedagogy of OER. I decided that was a little too stuffy. I so here's our current membership. Uh, we're up to about 100 colleges now. Um, eight are official members in California. Um, and hint, hint, LeVere in Washington State joined as an entire system for $368, okay, annually. California has, California has already paid eight times that. Well, not quite, because two districts joined. So we're trying to find a way for the the entire state of California to join so that it's a better deal for us. And, and regardless, you're all invited to participate. But it's, it's a matter of kind of lining up and saying open education is a positive direction for, for us. Yes? Sex in America. All right. Yes. We've been not a member, so I'm just going to get some information and find out how things go about. We are like a community college district, like Evergreen. Evergreen. Yeah. We're trying to work it out that way. But my other question is that uh, all the courses are created by, you know, the district collection from different colleges or colleges? So, <laughs> So in terms of open courseware, the community colleges are relatively new to, to open courseware. Where the strength has been is in open textbooks, um, but open courseware is now catching on. And so a, an open textbook may very well be the basis for the design of your course as well. Um, and um, this fall, we're going to do a webinar on, on for faculty who are, who are a little bit uncertain about kind of the, the whole how you put the whole thing together. So uh, because it, it still is more difficult than it should be to find all the open educational resources out there. Um, and we did actually have a session. We have an archive of a session where we had um, a librarian present and we had the Florida Distance Learning Consortium present on some of because they have a repository within their state. And we had um, someone from Rice University talk about the Connections Repository. So I'll point you at that um, as well. It might be a good start just to I think it's also uh, with really to help faculty get a library. Absolutely. Yes, because they are wonderful at finding resources. So yeah, that's great. Yes. If somebody comes up with an idea for a course um, or wants to participate in the structure with the process, so, so we we are here to support you in terms of um, finding or creating and, and sort of the process. 
I, I would recommend that um, if you have someone that, who's interested in that, that they contact me directly, and I can and I can point them to the right resource in terms of what they need. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's not quite as as <laughs> um, as organized as that at this point. The open courseware you can go up onto their site. Most of those courses are four-year university courses. Some of them are applicable to um, community college as well, but a lot of them will be at a level that will be a little higher than perhaps would be appropriate. Um, I would point you to College Open Textbooks, uh, which Jackie Hood here is from. She maintains a site of um, discipline-specific open textbooks. Um, there's over 750 open textbooks up there. Um, about 25 disciplines are covered. I think the other course where probably Merlot and also OER Commons. OER Commons is excellent. It is a wonderful search engine, yes, absolutely. OER Commons.org. .org, yes. If you're looking for general OER, that is definitely the place to go. Thank you, Jackie. All right. So why should you join us? So that you can uh, attend informative. <laughs> you can stay in the loop uh, on all of these uh, interesting issues. We have. Um, we have um, about 50 people on our advisory group right now. They're all leaders in OER from around the country. And um, the, we, as I said, we get together monthly just to discuss best practices and what's happening in their projects. In addition to that, we have a monthly outreach webinar that is available for all faculty to attend, um, faculty, staff, and administrators. Um, if you are looking for collaborators, this is a great group to come into because you may find other people to collaborate on. There's grants going on, so you could find partners. Um, we have a lot of visibility through the OCW um, website and, the, and our media outlets. So that will give you a lot more exposure. And it allows uh, our, us in the associate consortium, we provide direction to OCW, which is the, it is the largest um, consortium of open ed in the world. So thank you very much for your patience. Um, and it was a pleasure to speak with you. Um, and we'd love to have any of you join our advisory group. That's open to all. And if you go to our site there, oerconsortium.org, um, there's information about joining that. Yes, Judy. Yes. I'd like to thank you for continuing to give community college some voice in the open course room. Thank you, Judy. Otherwise, we get off. <laughs> and thank you, Judy, for providing a great example yesterday on how to. Oh. She, Judy just, just created an open course in health ed. I was still reading. That's right. Wait a minute, take a look. And I actually have.